engaging session. So I will kick us off. Uh, my name is Nicola Smith. I am the Regional Partnership Coordinator for Region 6, and I'm a member of the National Ecosystem Services Strategy Team. Um, so we'll, we'll begin this session with a little background on this team and the intent of hosting this webinar and really welcome your feedback on future um, offerings that we can provide and dialogues that you're all interested in as part of this community of practice. So the Forest Service um, National Ecosystem Services Strategy Team was chartered by the agency in 2013 and rechartered in 2016 with the primary goal of more formally developing a national strategy and policy around ecosystem services in the Forest Service and to think about ways to do so operationally in our programs. So the core team um, convenes every two weeks and consists of staff from the National Forest System, state and private forestry, uh, research and development, our headquarters, as well as regions. And we have interdisciplinary participation from folks like Travis, our speaker today, who come from the research and development community, communicators, um, climate change scientists, um, economists, planners, partnership folks to really bring diverse perspectives to how ecosystem services can <laughs> support our mission and our goals across programs. So our first major deliverable as a team was a general technical report um, that we published in 2017, identifying ways that ecosystem services can support our work in planning, particularly in terms of understanding the trade-offs of our management decisions, performance, in other words, how are our programs delivering in meaningful terms, and partnerships. So what's the kind of information that we really need both to build partnership platforms and also to build shared investments for restoration and conservation? So we're currently um, thinking about shared stewardship application of these tools. So how can we apply ecosystem services and our stewardship of resources across all lands? Some climate adaptation. Um, lens to performance and how can we understand the need to manage resilient landscapes from an ecosystem services perspective. Of course, environmental justice, particularly given the current administration's emphasis on that through the Justice 40 initiative, as well as information sharing opportunities like this one where we can engage in dialogue and hear from all of you. So that's a little background on this team. We really um, welcome participation from those of you who would like to be more involved or have thoughts about how we can be engaging with your program areas and staff. So before we get into um, the heart of the matter, which is hearing from Travis today, just a couple of housekeeping items. So if folks wouldn't mind, please um, muting their mics and keeping video off unless you're speaking or engaging in discussion just for bandwidth um, concerns. We'll go through Travis's presentation and please um, Note your questions in the chat. Members of our team will be pulling themes and tracking those questions. We'll also have a more informal opportunity to pose your questions following Travis's presentation. And before we get to that, I'm going to call on um, my colleague, Katie Brunson, who has prepared a poll for us to better understand how you currently use water, watershed and water quality metrics in your work. Um, so this just helps our team better understand how this information um, is currently being used or could be used in the future. So please just take a minute to check out this poll and give us a sense for how this information might be useful. Nicola, are you seeing it now? Yes. Great. <laughs> Nicola, should I kick things off? Should I keep going? Oh, sure. Yes, please. So, um, Travis, I had I pulled up a little bio for you, but it's probably more meaningful if you introduce yourself. So, feel free to do that, and I'll I'll just add anecdotally that um, Travis is a great member of our team in terms of understanding from a research perspective metrics that we have available to us in the agency to consider 
um, the relationship between watersheds and community and economic development, and also to inform our land management planning. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Travis, but please um, build out anything in your bio that you'd like to share and um, looking forward to your presentation. Sure, thank you. Um, yep, if anything happens with video or uh, sound, let me know. Um, I'm an economist with the Rocky Mountain Research Station. It's super great to be here. I'm kind of humbled by all the folks that have joined in. I was kind of expecting this to be a small group of people that are often in all the same webinars and settings and meetings that um, that I often attend. So with that in mind, Nicola mentioned that this is meant to be a dialogue. Um, and, and I think that's really where we want to go. So I'm hoping to present a lot of resources maybe throughout the Forest Service, either from my research or others that I've kind of kept in touch with or or other parts of the agency that are tracking through. So um, towards the end, uh, yeah, certainly uh, lots of discussion is, is the hope. Um, I'm going to start with what is probably motivating some of this work on, on my side. Um, it's probably a, a pet peeve, maybe a little bit of a confession about the things I hate most about the agency, probably. Um, and and I think it's the way that we we talk about natural resources, the way we we kind of frame our discussion, the way we we kind of think about the way we do our jobs, in a way that I think is is more draining, maybe sometimes than it should be. And and to I guess to think about what what I'm talking about, maybe if you take a moment of your own, you know, kind of mental space and think about the, like, what's the one issue that the agency is devoting most of its resources to, right? That tends to be consuming all of our budgets and our time and our mental capacity. Um, my guess is everyone has uh, a relatively common answer. Um, there's certainly a few that stand out. And I don't think it's probably what we went in the agency to do. I remember thinking as a as a high schooler about what I wanted to be when I grew up, and certainly as an adult of what I want to be when I grow up. Um, and and getting involved in natural resource economics, natural resource sciences. Uh, when I first started the Forest Service, it was really a, 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 about these things that I that I valued, things that I wanted to protect, things that I wanted to fight for. At the end of the day, after spending late nights and weekends and time away from family and all this other stuff, I was hoping at the end of my career to to look back and and look at a uh, a river system, a waterway, something cut uh, cute and cuddly that might be a stuffed animal on my child's bed, and say, "This is here because of 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 my life, right? Of of my career." It was really kind of this 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 thing that drove me into natural resources this idea of fighting for something and be able to look back at these at these values and say this is this is here because of me it's what keeps me going and when we start talking about things like fire which is probably where a lot of people were going with that question um that seems to be a discussion about things we're fighting against or things that we're administratively doing right like we're we're trying to reach these targets for fuels reduction or whatever, and I get that that's a big part of our our daily jobs of what we kind of get paid to do, but it's not what motivates us. And I think when we we tend to fall back on those, what are we fighting against? Um, we, yeah, we we get burnt out, we lose track of things. And I'd really like to move the, the discussion today, um, and the discussion is the agency, if if that ever happens towards a, a more discussion about what we're fighting for, that we're we're doing these things on the landscape, we're doing these management actions because there's things that we value. And I'm completely jealous of like the fish biologists and um, aquatic ecologists who, who, who seem to be devoting their lives towards protecting, you know, a species or a waterway. And, and, and I, I think that's the right mindset. And I really think um, I think that's the way to go. And that's why I like economics. That's why I like ecosystem services. Um, and uh, I don't know, that's my that's the message that I think I'm going to preach for the less next uh, kind of remaining in my career. So so hopefully you'll hear a lot and maybe by the time I retire we'll be we'll all be speaking the language of ecosystem services. Water, it's huge. I'm going to talk start by framing some of the discussion by why it's important to me. So this, little girl in the front of the picture is is my daughter. 
the the girl in the back is is one of her friends, a uh, uh, daughter of someone I grew up with in high school. And I grew up in Louisiana where where water and forest and trees were physically in the same space, right? It was hard to talk about the health of waterways with in, without introducing some aspect of trees, right? So I've, it's probably always destined to uh, to be where I am today. Um, my fondest memories of, of a child were spending summers fishing with my dad in Louisiana. Lots, a lot of it's bass fishing and, and pontoon boats, swimming off piers, that sort of kind of lifestyle. Uh, drove you know, a good part of the way I spent my time and the way I, I connected with family and the culture of the area and things that were incredibly important to me. I live in Colorado now, so the type of water has changed, but the but the ideas haven't, right? Like my, my summers are, are now spent not on uh, fishing boats, but maybe paddle boards in our lakes. And instead of spinner baits on uh, after bass, I'm often in uh, streams uh, fly fishing, but it's still a big part of, of, my, of my life. And it, when I think about things that I do, these are the values that come to the forefront of, of why I get up in the morning and come to the office or, or I turn my computer on to engage in these, these cultural values. Um, I think it, it's worth fighting for in Louisiana. Certainly we have the, the world's largest dead zone. We have the country's first climate refugees, history of toxic dumping in our swamps and waterways, um, an 85-mile industrial corridor known as Cancer Alley, which is sort of frightening to think about. Um, but all those those things are important because it's where we spend our time. It's where our human values come from. Um, I've seen firsthand we all have the consequences of getting land management wrong or the, the risk that might be on the landscape. This is a picture taken just a few months after the one of my daughter. So in September of this year, we had you know, I think are uh, relatively normal. I don't, not my area of expertise, but a, a storm camped out over over the mountains outside of Fort Collins and in, in a lot of burn area and sent a gush of water, a wall of water coming down into a small area with some homes. Um, I volunteer for our county search and rescue. I spent about a week uh, in September looking for the bodies that that kind of came out of this. We all know what we're fighting for and, and the consequences of getting that management wrong. And I think telling that story is important, right? We we do what we do because sometimes we like to spend the, the time on the lake with our kids and sometimes lives are lost when, uh, when, when things go awry. And moving that into a discussion, moving that to the forefront of, of the way we tell our story, I think has to happen um, if we're going to be sort of relevant. So everyone can think of their own values, your, their own happy places. We all have those special places. We all have those things that we value. We have our kids, we have our grandparents, whatever, um, and that we that we invest time into. Uh, and moving that up into the discussion about why you're here. Um, and we have to start talking about them as an agency. They're worth fighting for. And uh, yeah, and I think if we don't, um, then we're, we're likely to lose them. Um, What's the point um, of both this talk and ecosystem services? This is a conceptual framework of kind of ecosystem services in general. Um, generally, as an agency, this is my bias point as an economist, we focus too much on the left side of this picture. We focus on management actions. We're an agency full of ecological uh, scientists and practitioners, folks that, that are really, I guess, embedded on uh, on, on that side of this, sometimes we we talk about human activities, um, human activities, and God forbid, socioeconomic outcomes are completely underrepresented, in my point, in my view, anyway, in the agency. Um, and what we need to do is is move as far as we can down to that right side of of this slide. Um, we need to start talking about mental health, traditional uses, water treatment costs. If for no other reason, then it's the only way that we can really fulfill, uh, fulfill objectives like Justice 40. How do we know if we're reaching uh, underrepresented populations or if we're serving uh, minority or low income communities if we don't address the socioeconomic parts of it? So um, maybe you're turning in today because, um, well, now we're sort of legally required to do it and maybe we'll give you a little bit some tools of towards we get some, uh, moving towards that. Um, that goal. Water is huge. Um, it's crazy to have a webinar on it. Um, 
you know, a single webinar on water. Hopefully we'll have a lot more down the road. But uh, like you said, this is an intro to the conversation. There's generally two ways we think about water. How much is there? How good is the water? That how much is there might be a discussion of climate change, drinking water, in-stream flow, timing of runoff, that sort of stuff. How good is the water? Discussions about water quality, watershed health, threats to water, right? So this is roughly how, um, how the talk will be broken up today. How much water is there? I would say that we are relatively good at measuring it. Um, and people in the agency uh, who I saw kind of join in the chat are, um, are much better at it than I. So I'm the water specialist for, for a group called uh, the, or for a project called the Resource Planning Act Assessment. So every 10 years we do large assessments on, on the renewable resources. So if you're looking for for some of these results or some of this data, it will be kind of in the RPA assessment website. You can just Google RPA assessment, US Forest Service, and it will be there. Um, but we talked about water because it's core to our agency's mission. It was there when we first kind of came and uh, were founded or created. Um, and it matters because all of our stage and uh, all of our our states, our stakeholders are somehow connected with it. And we're an all land agency mission, or at least on um, a lot of part of what we do is, is engaging the all land part of it. In the East, um, forests are a huge part of, of where we get our water. In the West, a little bit, uh, maybe less on a, a total area served, um, but certainly the national forests are a bigger part of that. So. Um, we do this because, uh, yeah, because we have a lot to say. We have a lot to, a uh, lot to say uh, about the impact of our, our water resources. Um, here's some results that are uh, soon to be come out in uh, in the 2020 RPA assessment, looking at climate change. So a bit of terminology. This shows results of uh, for precipitation across two RCPs, which are uh, sort of relative strengths of, 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 of climate change. So RCP 8.5 stands for relative concentration pathways is a sort of a stronger climate change effect or impact than maybe RC, than RCP 4.5. Um, and you see uh, the, the host of models, wet, warm, mid, hot, dry, or the models that were used in, in this iteration of the RPA assessment. And we know it's getting hotter and drier. Um, this is kind of what a lot of our uh, our future looks like in the lands that we manage. Um, and uh, so resources, if you're everyone, uh, yes, these days is engaged more than uh, we've been in the past on, on climate change assessment. So if you're looking for resources, uh, certainly the RPA assessment is a uh, is a nice place to start. Um, otherwise, you probably have at the various research stations kind of local contacts. One great resource, if you haven't ever been there, is these National Forest Climate Change Maps. So if you just Google that, this will pop up. It's a website uh, or a suite of tools anyway, put out by folks at RMRS, the Rocky Mountain Research Station and the Office of Sustainability and Climate. And they're super great. There's a web, uh, a um, uh, story map that talks about climate, what it might mean for your, uh, uh, for your forest. And it leads you through a set of um, drop-down menus um, and ends up producing maps like this, which I absolutely love. I think this, these are fantastic products that we can start using today, right? They're uh, they're available on the on the website. So uh, this is a map of snow water equivalent uh, off the White River National Forest. So if you do all the drop downs, you can select the uh, sort of the measure that you want, um, and you can you can plug this right into a lot of your discussions right now. Yeah. So that that climate change mapping tool is is super awesome. So you should check out that. Um, there's other, oh, I see Claire's actually joined, so I'm glad I mentioned the RPA, so um, she posted a, a link to the website of, uh, of the group. But um, anyway, so these tools are readily available, um, and there's folks, uh, Charlie Lewis, I think, had a, a big part of engaging this project. Give him a call. He's sort of a hero of mine when it comes to climate change and water. Um, I think I saw uh, Kisun out of the Southern Station is might be on this call too. Um, the, the tools out of the Southern Station, the, the WASI uh, modeling group is phenomenal um, and has a suite of climate change resources. So um, you can think of this part of the presentation as resources that are out there, uh, contacts that you may want to make over the next sort of um, period of discussion uh, related to climate change. There's not enough uh, folks out there talking about what climate change means on 
the landscape or to our user groups. Uh, this is again results from this iteration of the RPA. Um, looking at um, this this idea of drought, but what we call socioeconomic drought or water shortage, where is there likely to be less water than people want? Um, and this data is available. If you, it's a complicated slide, so I'll kind of go through it. As you go from the top to the bottom, that one month, six month, 12 month, the rows, that's the duration of shortage. So how how long essentially is a community likely to be without the water that they want? And generally we make up for those shortages by things like reservoir, by things like uh, mining groundwater. Uh, so that's kind of moving down, moving to the right is that uh, sometimes called the return interval or that kind of frequency. If you think of the, the 50 year drought, it's um, it's that kind of statistical return period of, of the drought. Municipalities often uh, plan for this 50 year uh, shortage or this 50 year drought plan. So if you think of that middle column is often maybe the planning horizon. And and what we're seeing, unfortunately, is that um, the amount of water that that will be short um, it, on, on average will, will be greater. There'll be more water that we have to kind of account for in things like reservoir. It's going to cause more uh, groundwater mining, for example, if we return to groundwater uh, depletion. Under sort of status quo assumptions, so this highlights where we're likely to move into adaptation more so than mitigation when it comes to water and climate change. So if you're interested in this type of information, certainly reach out to me. Um, what can you do with it on a smaller scale? There's very few of us that do uh, that are so interested in national scale issues. Um, here's a map of Region 4 that a uh, great grad student, he's moved on now, but uh, the work is certainly there and available for folks that, that you're interested in, is mapping that to the actual users, because ecosystem services is all about the users um, and the people that might be dependent on that, our stakeholders, for example. Municipal water systems are a huge part of uh, of, of my work and a lot of the Forest Service partnership work. And we can say each of these dots on this map are water intakes. So where utilities might withdraw water for municipal water use. Um, and, and we can map those, those changes in, in uh, water availability to where it might impact the people that want it. Um, here in region four, we see that sort of front through that central, uh, through central Utah. Uh, areas that are high risk, those communities are are likely to expand, uh, experience in 2040 and 2080 relatively high degrees of, of risk to their water system and the water supplies. Um, areas of the state or areas of the region that are going to uh, need a lot more adaptation options, a lot more reductions in their in their water use. Um, lots of stakeholders out there. Sometimes the data varies in spatial scale when you deal with economics, uh, socioeconomic data is part of the game. Here's a picture for uh, out of that same work for Region 4 on vulnerability of livestock driven through changes in water. So I put this one up there because it's a nice sort of example of maybe where partners or user groups might uh, might be different. There's not going to be a lot of grazing in the in, in the metro areas that are drying out water, but certainly in the rangelands and the plains, it's, it's likely to be right. Um, so I think what I'm maybe the point of this slide is to think a little bit not just where water is likely to be short due to precipitation, um, but but who who uh, who cares, right? Um, having uh, lots of water where the users aren't um, is is less useful than having water where the users are. So, um, and and certainly for things like agricultural statistics, unfortunately that's at the county level, um, and in the west counties are huge, uh, but. But tying that back to the users um, is, uh, is super great. So this is work with uh, Matt Elber. Elmer is, is the name of the student. Chris Miller uh, is with EMC and Matt Reeves also at uh, RMRS. So. If you're looking for resources related to adaptation, I can't talk enough about the um, at the, the regional uh, threat assessment centers, both adaptationpartners.org and forestadaptation.org. Uh, have a tremendous amount of resources where you can drop down. Again, you can do a menu based approach to um, to the ecosystem service that you're interested in, let's say water, um, and look at adaptation options around some of those. Uh, some of those resources, so check out those um, either for WeTAC in the West or NIACS in kind of the North and the East. So 
well worth checking out. Um, gonna move a little bit to a relatively short uh, underserved discussion of watershed health um, and try to convince you or at least maybe give an example of, of the way we might talk about both risk and values in the same discussion because you know, that's kind of um, where I live my life and my career. So um, going to do it with an example for the Colorado Front Range. Um, in general, we're relatively good in this agency about talking about risks. Um, there's lots of maps out there. Um, the, this is a screenshot of a, um, of a story map that's kind of in, in process of development. But, you know, we have lots of data about road density and housing density, fire potentials, uh, mining, all these sorts of things that generally cause risk on the landscape and, and might pressure, uh, uh, cause pressure to our watersheds. Probably my favorite place to get risk-based data, uh, especially if you're working with uh, municipal water groups, is forest of faucets. Um, the 2.0 version of it is phenomenal, lists a wide range of uh, threats out there. Um, wildfire, land use change, I believe there's uh, invasive species and uh, insects and pests on there as well. So forest to faucet stuff is, is phenomenal when it comes to mapping risk. Um, we probably all have our, our favorite ways to do that as well. My challenge to you and to the agency is to, to move that a little bit into what does it mean and, and maybe a more fine-grained uh, discussion of risk. I looked at this map and I was just like, well, if you're in Northern California, you're kind of out of luck. Like, I don't really know what to do with a, a map that shows like all of the West at high risk of something, right? Like, what do you, you know, what do you do with that? Um, it really is great for motivating, motivating a, a national discussion, but um, hard to motivate an ecosystem services discussion. Um, so if we wanted to move human values into some of these maps or some of these discussions about watershed values, um, one way to do it, probably the most popular way in the literature I would say to do it, is to do some sort of ranking, it could be, or, or quantification, um, that could be driven by qualitative measures of the of the quality of the watershed. You can talk about, so one, I would say that this is completely made up data. If you know these watersheds, um, don't get hung up on these numbers. But for each of the huts, so for each of the watersheds, you can list out the things that you think either community members or you as an agent, uh, as a land manager might care about. So I, this one, I took recreational fishing, carbon storage and drinking water. I like these because even if you're targeting one, it moves us into a discussion of what are called co-benefits, the things that you get in, in addition kind of as you manage for, for one of the resources. So sometimes if you, yeah, you, if you manage for recreational, fit, recreational fishing, it's likely that drinking water improves. It's possible that carbon storage includes is include, included. Uh, when I show slides like this or these discussions, the folks in the ecosystem services world, certainly the economist, I always say, whoa, 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 you need to have discussion about the, su the supply and the demand. So the supply of ecosystem services is generally the capacity of the landscape to provide the resource. So in something like recreational fishing, where in a stream are the fish, for example, right? That might be the su uh, supply side of the discussion. And the ecosystem services sort of moves it a little bit more to, to say, okay, so here's where the fish are, but where are the people fishing, right? Where are those, those two meeting? And you can, you can map out both of those. You can list places that are where, uh, where there's that heavy supply of the, of the ecosystem services, as well as where there might be uh, um, heavy demand and see where those intersect, which is super useful. Um, how do you get to these zero, one, two, three? So um, I arbitrarily chose this designation. In this case, I said one was um, sort of a low value or low quality. Maybe the ecosystem services two was middle and three was was high, where zero might be where it uh, where it doesn't exist. So, um, so these types of metrics are uh, easy to do, relatively easy to do, um, and super popular and super useful. It's an easy way to get ecosystem services on the same maps that sometimes the risk uh, risk levels will. So, here's what. Um, Here's what a map of that might look like. So here I've done angling demand. Um, you can tell that this is made up data because uh, there's heavy demand kind of out on, on the grasslands, which I'm not saying that grasslands don't have a lot of angling demand, but um, anyway. Uh, and then 
And then how do you sort of talk about ecosystem services that occur in the same space? Um, I don't think it needs to be overly complicated. Generally, the literature I read is not. You can add them up. You can add up all the scores of the ecosystem services and just see where they like kind of stand out and then have a more nuanced discussion about it. Um, in this case, I just took the average of the, uh, the ecosystem service scores. So this is for that the angling climate um, and drinking water. So this is pretty easy to do, pretty easy uh, to engage with someone like me at, and on the research side or someone in probably the regional offices um, have this capacity sometimes, hopefully. Uh, if uh, if it doesn't exist on the forest, but um, widely popular in the literature, super helpful, meets a lot of the needs of the stakeholders. And I like it because we can start having more uh, more discussions like this. So it just turns out out of the the random kind of collection of uh, data that I put that if we were only to um, focus on the risk, so these aggregate risks to watersheds, what we get is something that like the high value angling sites, only 5% of them are at high risk. Um, so if, we, if our goal was to reduce risk for the sake of reducing risk, we're only going to target 5% of the, high, well, okay, this is 5% of the watersheds that are high value. Um, but, uh, but, you know, is it more important to address the 20% in that high value angling that are medium risks, right? I don't know the answer to that. I think it's a discussion for land managers involving stakeholders. Is it important to address high value ecosystem services, you know, or or high value, um, high value, high levels of risk? I mean, of course, we're doing both of that, and I'm completely oversimplifying the way folks handle risk in this agency. I know that this is mostly for illustration purposes. Um, a lot of folks are probably looking for metrics and specific places to start. It's hard because it involves some um, kind of partnership discussions. Uh, me, uh, personally, I like kind of multiple choice tests more so than uh, essay, at least when I don't really am not familiar with the, uh, with the topic. Um, a great place to start is a lot of uh, national or international metrics around ecosystem services. So the EPA has this thing that's called the Final Goods Service Final Goods and Services Metrics Report, or FEDS. Um, if you Google that, you'll get something like looks like this spreadsheet, and it's got like hundreds of, uh, of ecosystem services on there. You can sort them by aquatic or water-based, um, recreational, who the user group is. So I pulled out, this is recreational angling, for example, um, and it lists actual metrics. So the metrics for this one is presence, richness, and abundance of desirable fish. It lists a database that has a lot of this information that you can draw from. Um, what I've mostly been told of, of the folks that, that use FEDS is you either love it or you hate it. It does bound the dis discussion and moves you towards uh, a more specific, uh, maybe metric, than, than sometimes we want as we as we start to introduce these regional values. So um, I've, I offer it as a place to start, uh, if not necessarily a place to finish. Um, kind of up to up to the people doing the work. And of course, in the Forest Service, we have this wonderful watershed condition framework, which I think has a meeting right now that this webinar might be competing to. So hopefully they're recording that one because I'd love to hear where the watershed condition framework uh, is going. There's already, we're already assessing watersheds for, for things like the aquatic uh, and, and physical health of the watersheds, right? There's, there's things, things that are going through. So um, it might make sense as an agency to start the watershed condition framework um, and build up from there. Um, I haven't talked so much about um, economic values. Maybe people were um, uh, expecting more of that. I don't really know. Um, I find it's not always necessarily or necessary or useful to talk about dollar values when we talk about ecosystem services, but it turns out the agency has a rich history of it. So. Folks, uh, just a few doors down from me, literally wrote the book on non-market valuation. The, the group uh, that I sit in is now called Human Dimensions. It used to be called uh, uh, Heavy on Valuation. So Patty Champ, Tom Brown are all on my hall. The agency has lost a lot of capacity in, uh, in valuation. It's, it's, a, it's a place that I think we're short of. Hopefully we're building back. Um, Sonia Colstow is the, uh, the NEST member who is probably the most uh, versed in non-market valuation. So if you have a non-market valuation question, 
reach out to her. She's um, she's relatively new to the agency and uh, would, I'm sure would be glad to to engage with you. Um, there is also something called the USGS Benefits Transfer Toolkit, which is super cool. What they've done is taken a bunch of stuff from the literature and distilled it into kind of regional values. So for example, in the Intermountain West, freshwater fishing, a day of freshwater fishing comes to about $79 a day. So check out the USGS Benefits Transfer Toolkit. Um, that value um, is based across sort of an average statistically different um, of a freshwater fishing, 260 studies. I'm going to leave with a little bit of a caveat. So one of the frequent questions I get uh, as a forest service economist working on water is what's the value of, of, of a healthy forest uh, for something like water treatment costs? And it's very obvious to us, probably, hopefully, that healthy forest, although I've been told it depends on the, the region you're in, um, Healthy forests generally lead to healthier uh, waterways, right? So reduces things like sediments in the water. If you worked with any water utilities or if you sort of think through the process, it makes relatively uh, good sense, I guess, that clean water is easier to treat. It's less costly. This is why our partners engage with us. Um, this is folks, uh, this is, yeah, this is, these are the two parts are relatively well, well understood. In my work, I've tried to go from what's the, how do you go from forest to cost just to make that uh, that leap? Turns out those are widely complex systems that that uh, forests are are um, are complex. Water treatment is super complex, and um, and we may not have the data to put dollar values on on that direct link. And I don't think we have to. I don't think we should let it hold up management. I don't think we should let it hold up. Um, engagement with stakeholders. I think it's okay to go forward without monetary values um, for a lot of what we do because sometimes they're really hard to measure. Um, gonna leave with a sort of a call to action. Where are we going from here, both as Nest and myself, uh, because it relies on you to some degree. Uh, so one, let's move to the right of that discussion or the, the right of this slide. Let's talk about human values um, as often as we talk about risk, um, let's talk a little bit more of, about what's what's at risk. Um, there's a lot of concern that ecosystem services are about commodifying nature, um, and I think that's not right. It's not always about putting economic values on nature, but recognizing that nature has value and putting that into our, in our perspectives. There's um, national, international groups that do something called natural capital accounting that puts actually, if you think about like, GDP accounts things um, into uh, uh, in, into national accounts for for yeah for things like GDP um, adding nature into that and and I think it's likely to be a big part of what I'm to do in the future. So if you're interested in getting involved in that state uh, case studies are always super fun and interesting. Interesting. So reach out to me um, with with some of that work. So with that thanks. Um, I don't know. I like Alice in Wonderland. I think it's a daunting task, but I don't think it's one that we are uh, not able to achieve. So with that, I think I'm going to stop sharing and uh, open it up to discussion. Well, thanks so much, Travis. Really appreciate it. And I am going to now look to my colleagues, Lara and Sherry, who are also on the National Ecosystem Services Strategy Team to see if there are some themes or key questions that we can call out in the chat. What do you think, Laura and Sherry? So, uh, I, Laura, if you don't mind, I, I've got one here um, from David Ritchie, and uh, he's asking, how do you, sorry about this, how do you reconcile or describe the often distal effects of management actions on endpoints such as water quality, if there's an if there's an obvious source, it can be easier to justify actions than when there are broader conditions and not specific actors. Okay. Hey, Travis, Travis, if you like, we can invite David to to come on camera and slash sure. audio. Yeah, yeah. David, thanks so much for joining. Um, great to have you on here. But if there, if you want to elaborate, David, feel free. I was. Uh, Mainly just uh, so referring to your slide where we're wanting. So this is not a question for the right hand side of the slide, which is where you're wanting to move the discussion. But uh, on the left hand side of this slide, often when we're trying to take management actions on the landscape, 
Um, if we are looking for some sort of cost benefit justification, it's very difficult to tie any particular action, especially in say a broad watershed um, or a large watershed, let me say, um, to uh, some sort of endpoint uh, action. And, and therefore, I appreciate your comment that we, we should try and avoid that, but often in discussions of prioritization or in sort of the, you know, if your utility has a board, for instance, in board discussions, it's like, well, we're putting money for this. What is it going to get us on the on the end point? And it's a very hard discussion. Oh, one, uh, one, 100%. Yeah. I feel like the conservation folks uh, are wrestling with this nonstop. Um, it's probably a discussion for some of the hydrologists on here. Um, one thing that I have found is also that when we limit the discussion to a single user, so what's the value to a water utility, for example, um, turns out that treating forests, uh, improving forest health is super expensive, and it's not always, the cost is not always greater than a single benefit. So also moving that discussion into multiple benefits um, is, is worthwhile. But yeah, how to get to these um, diverse um, impacts. I don't know. That's I think that's a that's an interesting topic. Um, I don't know if folks have uh, insights on that. Um, yeah, I I don't know. I, I I struggle with that as well. So I think that uh, Laura has another question. Great. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight um, Brian Ratcliffe's question there kind of towards the end of the chat. He was asking if you could elaborate, Travis, on why the correlation between forest health and water treatment cost is so noisy. Sure. Um, well, one for that same um, same question that first came up, right? Like, how do you directly relate um, change in forest health or or you know, to water quality. And it's tricky. Um, it depends on, yeah, things like precipitation, things like, you know, the other things that we tend to manage for, right? Um, so so the variance just in that, so if it was a statistical regression, for example, right, there's a, there's a mean, but then there's variance around it. Well, when you look on the water treatment side, then it depends on things like, are they over-treating to sort of meet some standards, right? So if they're, if they're, um, you know they're they're legally required to to meet standards. So they they do their their treatment, their their chemical or mechanical treatment to do that. Um, it can't be completely variable um, all the time, or else I mean treating the water would be a headache, right? That would be super super complicated. Um, and there's different ways to treat it. There's different technologies um, across the different systems, different ways communities have done it. So I think that it's variance on one side. So on the water treatment side and variance on the watershed side, and just the additive variance, I mean, just makes a noisy signal. Thanks, Travis. You know, I see Brian's hand is raised, so I'm wondering if you might have a follow-on or complimentary uh, comment to offer, Brian? Brian, did you want to chime in? There we go. Can you hear me? Perfect. Now? Okay, yes. perfect. I forgot I had to do the star six thing because I'm calling in. Yeah, thanks, Travis. Really appreciate that elaboration. I'm I'm curious. So I'm thinking about the Forest Resilience Fund in California and the way that they're, you know, one of the major payers into that product, that conservation finance product is the is the water utility. And they're looking at avoided costs for like dredging reservoirs and things like that. That's obviously slightly different from water treatment. Um, so I guess there's a number of dimensions. There are a number of ways that you could connect forest health to water health, sort of more broadly um, conceived. And so I'm curious if you've looked at at that, or if you're looking if that particular study was just narrowly focused on, you know, at the water treatment plant itself, the the, the marginal cost there of different treatments. That one focused on on the water treatment itself, so the chemical costs related to things like sediment. Did notice if he wants to chime in that Jonas Epstein is here, and he's the one I go to for all these questions. Um, he's yeah certainly well versed on how do you turn a healthy watershed into a measurable impact for a community. I'll rely on the dialogue part of this discussion. Sure, Brian. For for that for that particular instance, I think you're referring to the Yuba Water Partnership. Um, they focus mostly on water retention and reduced um, 
uh, evapotranspiration. So essentially it was a coefficient that they used when they did meadow restoration in that watershed. They applied the coefficient based on um, uh, the, the basically thinning to um, keep water in the system. And then the, the business justification was made not for the water quality treatment side, but for the, the water retention side of the equation. Um, there's a confidence interval there, and it is still dependent on um, atmospheric conditions over time, but it was a reasonable enough estimate, and Yuba Water had seen wildfires in the past um, degrade that landscape to the point that they were willing to invest um, and cost share that with other payers. So there was a water retention benefit that was that was justifiable, and that also, like Travis had mentioned earlier, was not the only um, benefit category or beneficiary that was engaged. Um, so CAL FIRE had also cost shared in that particular partnership model because they saw the benefits of avoided wildfire risk reduction. So when the benefits are diffuse, even if the, the source of contamination or avoided contamination is further away, um, you can still make a justification for investment. Um, but I will say in the forest resilience bond context, we have not yet um, economically justified water quality treatments as a as a um, as a revenue stream for that for that financial model yet so nicola i've got a a question here from uh gordon grant and he might want to um unmute uh i'll just read gordon what you have in the box here first um if i can get that cursor going correctly uh here we go you emphasized, let's see, sorry, the, uh, places where there's good alignment between one type of ecosystem service and, a, and another, for example, fishing and water quality. But it seems to me that the real issue arises where ecosystem services uh, do not align. For example, forests represent the single largest consumers of, precipita of precipitation. And sorry, the cursor does not not being friendly. Gordon, did you want to come on off of your uh, mute and uh, share your thoughts? Sure. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm sorry, it's, uh, it was a long, it was a long winded uh, question as usual. Um, so Travis, thanks for what you've given us. Um, I, I'm interested in though, and it seems to me in most of the discussions about ecosystem services, we emphasize, and, and this was sort of the last uh, um, questioners who had the same theme in mind. We tend to emphasize this idea that, you know, forests are sort of good things for water. Um, but that all depends on how you look at it, uh, because in terms of returning precipitable water to the back to the atmosphere, um, forests are the single largest consumer by far of water. They eclipse agriculture, everything we do in the landscape total eclipse by forest, quote, consumption, which of course is necessary if you're going to keep a forest around. My question really is, how do ecosystem service thinking uh, reconcile the issue that, you know, if you're going to keep water on the landscape for the purposes of trees, and then hence all the other water quality, et cetera, benefits that, for, that are derived from that, how do you reconcile that with the way people, I think, often want to sort of frame the issue in terms of water delivery, you know, that we're going to we're, we're going to get more water if we hold the forest, which isn't true. But I but it seems to me that that's that kind of falls through the cracks sometimes of the ecosystem service argument. How do we reconcile those different, you know, non-aligned uh, downstream use versus retaining water on the landscape? Yeah. Um... I think, um, well, one, I think that's kind of the point of ecosystem services is, is to recognize that there are multiple values and whether or not we as an agency are managing to the right one. So the forest and water one is is tricky because um, my naive understanding of the science is 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 that we we don't always know, um, you know, kind of what happens on different time scales for uh, related to the amount of trees on the landscape and the water in the river, right? Like what what that sort of means, um, at what scale it matters. Uh, certainly there's there's folks who know a lot more about it than I do. Um, the other part of that though, is that if you just take two ecosystem services that are opposed 
And if you're not talking to the stakeholders about what matters, then you're then one, we should do that. Um, and if you're getting a different message than the way we're managing, then that's a different discussion, right? So, I mean, if the if the community says cut down the trees because we want the water, then that's sort of a you know like that's sort of a crazy discussion to begin with. But um, but you never know. Like it's maybe it's one that we need to have. So I I guess the short answer is that if we don't address ecosystem services and a discussion about values, how do we know if we're managing to what people want? And should we be managing to what we, they want? Yeah, there's no, I mean, so there's also an economic answer that marginal returns should equal, like we should, we should like increase one and decrease the other till those, till those values are, are kind of reflected in people's preferences. And um, that's kind of the, the econ techie way to say it. Um, but, but I think the other is just that it opens the discussion. If I can just respond to that, I, I agree with you that it's an important discussion to have, but I think we often sort of have this notion that it's, in a sense, we're whistling past the graveyard because people have very competing notions of what they want. Sure. <laughs> and they're e equally, you know, justifiable. So the, the issue then becomes who gets to decide? And right. of course, we we decide because we manage, but presumably we're listening. So that's I understand your point that we should be using this as a framing for how we listen to things. But I also think that we should be more cognizant and more articulate and more um, humble in the face of the fact that we these are it may be difficult to reconcile these different objectives. Thanks. And and recreation is certainly the where this comes up too, right? I mean, you can't have both OHV and wilderness in the same place. So. Hey, folks, I, I might be able to provide a, a little bit of an answer to Gordon, if I if I may. Sure. Hey, folks, Dave Levinson in Fort Collins. I'm uh, the WO National Program Lead for the National Stream and Aquatic Ecology Center. I'm my office is right down the street from Travis. And uh, but I know Gordon, Dr. Grant. Your question also hits at um, in-stream flows and in the regulatory uh, environment that we live in with, with water. So I'm not the expert on the staff that does this, but Dave Merritt is our natural riparian ecologist and he does uh, quantification of flows for forest resources as part of our wilderness and wild scenic river work. So if it involves wilderness and wild and scenic rivers, there is a comprehensive river management plan and typically there's a Federal Reserve water right to maintain certain flows for forest resources, okay? And so there is a regulatory framework here as well. And this is an incredibly complicated thing, as you can imagine, Gordon, you probably know some of this already, but the point is when you are uh, submitting under the Wilderness Act or the Wild and Scenic River Act, how much water does the forest need? How much water does do plants need? How much for, how much water do, do, does flora and fauna need? How much water does fish need? Okay. And so typically that is dealt with through both the states as well as Federal Reserve water rights through in-stream flow quantification. And so what I would suggest here is the ecosystem services folks really should be coordinating in some ways with those working on in-stream flows because there is a relationship here of providing ecosystem services through river flows that are adequate at maintaining our resources. And that, but it typically only and mainly occurs with Federal Reserve water rates on wilderness and wild and scenic. Okay, so I'll leave it there. But Travis, I'm more than happy to connect you with Dave Merritt, who does all the in-stream flow work on our staff, and he can provide a lot of background. It tends to move around based on adjudications with river systems. Okay, so anyway, I'll leave it at that. But it's a but it's a great question, Gordon. I'm not surprised it came from you because uh, I know you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it. I'm not necessarily seeing uh, other questions in the chat. Laura, do you have one queued up that you've been holding on to? 
You know, there was just a broader thought question, which, um, you know, given the timing, um, perhaps we could take. It was from uh, Tanya Ellersek. Um, just kind of a, a throw out to all of us, uh, those that are part of the, the Nest um, group and those that are just involved in ecosystem services work. Um, and this is just really a, a broad brush, but if there's anything that you wish agency leadership would consider, um, my words and or maybe prioritize, in regard to ecosystem services. Um, we'd just love to hear your thoughts on that. I'm gonna give my answer and then we can do a round robin. Um, the, there's a lot of folks, um, USGS has been leading out, I think, on natural capital accounting about putting ecosystem services in naturally consistent frameworks and things like that look like these GDP, GDP accounts so that you can manage around it, so that you start to incorporate ecosystem services and natural capital into it. So it's called natural capital accounting. Um, at least the folks that I know, uh, I know USGS seems to be leading out these days. Um, I think the agency has fallen well behind in um, in and where we are with ecosystem service stuff. Uh, so my hope over the next year is to get more engaged with that community and to drag the Forest Service along with me. So. Um, and to, to really put that sort of work onto national forest lands. It's all the DOI stuff is, is there. Um, they've done a really good job of it, and we have been missing from that conversation. Other folks? Yeah, this is Sherry, and um, I actually just have a comment to that, uh, Travis, which is this connects back to conservation finance. When you actually are able to get the agency to come along with that that is super valuable uh information that can attract um frankly hordes of partners as long as we're able to provide the granular level of um measurement that they're using and that they understand will meet their internal uh mission goals or the regulatory regulatory goals they're um dealing with so that's a very valuable um, effort for for this agency. So I'm going to be the grumpy facilitator and acknowledge that we're almost at time, but um, really, really appreciate the rich dialogue and the incredible subject matter expertise that's on this call, including um, some of our partner organizations. So really appreciate that. And to the great question that Tanya raised, we actually have a related poll. So I know folks will soon need to transition to their next call, but um, Katie has prepared a poll about topics of interest for future dialogue. It's also really clear to me that there is a lot of, of rich and important discussion um, related to this topic as well. So I would task our team with um, with thinking that through and, and suggesting some next steps. But before we formally adjourn, anything else that any of our team members um, would like to address? Or Travis, any closing thoughts? No, this has been awesome. I'm super great for everyone joining in. And reach out to me with, yeah, future work and ideas. Yeah, really appreciate the excellent um, questions and dialogue. So thank you everyone for joining. If you're interested in engaging with our team in the future, reach out to any of us at any time and have a very good Thanksgiving if we don't connect before then. So take care, everyone. <laughs>